I'm here with Christy Hansen. She's the project manager for Operation Icebridge. She's the one that keeps this whole symphony running smoothly. Where did you grow up and where did you go to high school? I grew up in a suburb outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I went to a high school called Pancras High School in Media, Pennsylvania. What were you interested in in high school? Well, in high school, um, I, I pretty much had three different uh, loves, I should say. Um, I loved athletics, played sports all year long for all four years I was in school, so uh, volleyball, basketball, swimming, diving, uh, track and field, and I threw the javelin and discus and did the hurdles in track. So that, uh, that took up a lot of my time, I loved that. Um, and then uh, my second love was studying science. I was always very interested in science. I didn't know exactly what I was going to do. Um, I always had dreams of flying in space, uh, human space flight. I had an interest in that, but I didn't know what career I would go, so I figured I would just keep studying science and math and, and maybe see where that would take me. Um, and I also loved music, so I was in choir for a while as well when I was in high school. Where'd you go to college? Uh, I went to Villanova University, which is kind of outside Philadelphia, Pennsylvania as well. And I majored in something called comprehensive science, and I minored in physics. And what comprehensive science was, was a, a compilation of all sciences and math. So I took um, biology 1 and 2, chemistry 1 and 2, all the physics classes and um, all the calc classes and differential equations. So I knew, again, you know, I knew science, I was interested in that, but which, you know, which field specifically. Um, so I emphasized in physics, uh, wondering where that would take me. Um, I also got a master's degree in uh, science from the University of North Dakota Space Studies program. And what really interested me uh, with that program was the wide variety of classes they exposed you to. So it wasn't as specific as you might get, but um, you did classes in space vehicle design, uh, meteors and comets, orbital mechanics. Um, they also had remote sensing classes. And then even studying military space, uh, Russian space program. Tell us about your career at NASA. So, so far at NASA, um, I'm on my, my third project. Uh, my first one started in 1999, right out of grad school. Um, I had heard of... Uh, a job down at Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas, where they actually train astronauts and do flight control work. And actually, uh, during one of my classes at the University of North Dakota, one of the distance degree students who worked at Johnson had seen me on footage and thought I might be a good candidate, someone new with energy, looked very interested, um, thought maybe I, I, I could do well down at Johnson. So uh, they interviewed me, they flew me down, and they found a position for me out of school in the extravehicular activities group. So this is if I think of my dream of dream jobs, um, if I never flew in space, this first one coming out of college was, was my favorite. So I felt like I got to use some of my physics a little bit, um, but really it was uh, a lot of uh, physics applications, but a lot of operations and organizational skills, hands-on work. So um, I ended up training astronauts on the Space Shuttle, International Space Station, and Hubble Space Telescope. So essentially, I'd get a task or assigned a flight. Hey, Christy, you're the, the EVA lead. We need you to install this port truss onto the port side of the International Space Station. You have three spacewalks to do it. You have to reconfigure some wires, uh, change out a battery. Now put that whole plan together, meaning how many nuts and bolts are there? What turns and torques do they go to? How do you train the astronaut to hold tools and work in microgra microgravity environment? How do you do that all in six and a half hours? Um, how do you plan for contingencies while you're up there? So that was my uh, main priority when I was down at Johnson. Mm -hmm. And then after you train the crew, you'd wear the headset, you sit in mission control, and you'd be ready for any kind of contingency or troubleshooting during the spacewalks on orbit. So our motto was plan, train, fly. You told me that you also went in the big tank there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell me what that's like. Yeah, that, oh, that was pretty amazing. I, I had to get rid of that, you know, huge eye look when I first uh, showed up at work my first day thinking, am I really going to be doing this? I can't believe it. But you don't want to admit that because you'll get made fun of, right? But I, I really think to this day, my energy and enthusiasm got me there. Um, I mean, good grades, but showing drive, showing that you'll go the extra mile, never letting anyone stop you. So uh, I remember the first day I found out I'd have to get scuba certified um, because the class you would train the astronauts in would be when they're learning new objectives, when you have to teach them a new task. They want you to get under on scuba in the neutral buoyancy tank, which is a 40-foot, 6.2 million gallon tank of water, where they had full-scale mock-ups of the space shuttle um, and the International Space Station. So you'd, you'd figure out what your objectives were, A, B, C, and D. You'd write them on underwater paper, and then you get on scuba with your tools, and I would take the astronauts down, maybe starting at the airlock, and say, we're going to go from point A to point B, here's your task, now follow me. And we go down underwater, and they follow me, and we go through, you know, pointing at underwater paper with your tools, look at me, look there, and then they'd get to practice that stuff. Um, and that would be their introduction into some of their more detailed classes. And where'd you go from Houston then? 
Yeah, so I did that for ten and a half years. So I loved it. I mean, it was really hands-on. I liked playing with hardware. It was really good responsibility, especially for someone coming out of school. Um, if you like teaching, I mean, this is, I had no idea I was going to be a teacher, but essentially suddenly I became a teacher of astronauts. Anyway, so after that, I thought, how can I grow, maybe expand a little bit what more is out there? So um, I had heard at uh, Goddard Space Flight Center in central Maryland that they were working on trying to get a new payload to the International Space Station. And they have a lot of really good uh, tool design engineers, um, hardware people, but they didn't have anyone with true space station operations experience. And I had known some of them from working on Hubble, so they knew me. And they knew I was looking around, so as soon as they knew, they said, we need an operations lead. Can you come up here and help us put our plan together? So like that, I, I found the job. I, it was hard to leave all my friends at Johnson. They're still my best friends. Um, moved up to Goddard Space Flight Center and set up camp there for a year and a half as the operations manager for the, it was called the robotic refueling payload. Um, so someday the idea would be, instead of launching new communication satellites or new weather satellites, maybe someday we could rendezvous with a, a broken satellite and actually fix it using robotics. So the space station portion was just a technology demonstration. Let's put this cubicle washing machine on space station and um, let's use, uh, let's, let's demonstrate some of these tools we designed and, and show that maybe someday we could fix things that look like a satellite. So I had to put that plan together. Let's test out these tools. Let's get procedures together. How do we follow the rules and constraints of space station? How do we build robotics procedures? And we do it all in the right order, in the right time, following all the correct rules. And now you're with Operation Icebridge. That's right. So um, I, I helped the RRM, Robotic Refueling Mission, get off the ground, run through their first operations, and then thought, you know, what else is going on at Goddard? And I started looking around, and I found this project called Operation Icebridge. And I was like, what is that? And as soon as I heard ice in it, and I, I looked at the website, I thought, airplanes and ice. And that even though I had never st truly studied glaciology or ice, I had done some mountaineering, and I was fascinated by it. And I've always been fascinated by aviation, and I thought, let's put these two things together. I have a lot of operations experience, um, some management experience, and, and just lots of different pieces um, that can, can build up your skill set, right? So I, I, I looked around, and I figured, you know, um, Operation Ice existed. At the time, it was like the stars aligned, because they did need some project management. They had, had not had project managers. And I thought, hey, that's a big, that's a bigger step for me to go into a higher level position of managing a project and people. So I thought it'd be interesting to try. So we, it was a perfect fit. Um, they needed someone to come in and help with that. So that's kind of what got me onto Operation Icebridge. What are the best parts of your job? So I think the, the best parts of Icebridge are, you just look at it and you're like, what do you do? You're flying at 1,500 feet. This is what I read on the website, 1,500 feet collecting geophysical data on the changing uh, sea ice glaciers and ice sheets of Antarctica and Greenland. And as soon as I heard that, I thought, what an important thing to do, right? Um, so, and I have an adventurous side and I love to explore. So I thought, you know, how can I put all this together? So what I really like is seeing, here's your task. Go to Greenland, collect this data, work with all the teams, months in advance to plan it, go into the field and execute it and then report about it and make sure you're meeting all your requirements. Mm -hmm. And it kind of reminded me a little bit about my um, NASA job at Johnson kind of how I considered you plan, you train, and you fly. So you go from A to Z getting everything done with many different people who are spread out all over the country. How can I come in here and work with scientists all over the country, instrument operators all over the country? We have multiple aircraft offices that we work with. Um, we have NASA headquarters who are kind of our big bosses. And understanding how all those pieces fit together and where my role is. How do I work with these people who I'm not necessarily their boss? Um, so I think uh, putting all those pieces together and it's a lot of hard work, but seeing it come to fruition and seeing the team be successful, um, I like, uh, if I can help one person do one thing on one day, I am happy. I feel like I've, I succeeded. If I can enable the team to do their job, I feel like I've succeeded. What advice would you have for a young person, particularly someone in high school, that wanted to follow in your shoes? I think, um, you know, I know a lot of people probably have a different response to that, but I, I will say, I think what got me this far is drive and determination. Um, I mean, obviously you have to have a love of a science or math or engineering. Um, try to avoid any kind of stereotypes. Don't let anyone tell you, you can't do that because you don't look like the right person. You can't do that because, you know, you didn't get an A in the class. I would never let anything stop me. You know, maybe I didn't do, generally I would do well, but if I didn't do well, I never let that stop me from pursuing my dreams. So um, I just always had an interest and a drive to do things. Um, look outside of the outside of the box. I mean, when I was in school, I didn't even know there were airborne campaigns. I didn't know that there were people who trained astronauts. So now that at least students today growing up have the internet, they can look out there and understand that all your jobs are not in the classroom. You can trek on Greenland or Antarctica. You can fly on airplanes. You can go to space someday. You can work with robotics in a robotics lab. 
you can fly satellites from, you know, from your seat in a building. I mean, there's a, I would just say there's an infinite another, a number of options that are out there, and to never limit yourself because some, maybe somebody said, I don't think that's the right thing for you, or you don't look like the right kind of person to do that. Um, if I ever listened to people telling me that, I would not be here today. And I love to reflect back on, I can remember every time somebody told me, you couldn't do that or you're not, not the right person, and uh, I'm just glad I never listened to them. So that's one thing. Don't ever give up. Try harder. Um, you know, if someone tells you you can't do it, it makes you work extra hard, and then you can just so you can show them, yes, look at what I did, and then you, there'll be no limits to what you can do.